so hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. It's great to speak at uh, sort of a homecoming event like this again. Uh, my name is Vincent, I've been uh, organizing the PyData for a while, and I would love to talk to you about what I think is one of the biggest problems out there. Because um, I think as a data scientist community, and as sort of if I look at what people are doing with data, and I must say, like, this is not necessarily based on stuff I see actual human beings do, it's also stuff that I read of in like, Hacker News and stuff. Uh, but I think we are sometimes in a profession of solving the wrong problem. Uh, and there's a couple of true stories, and like I'll show you, so I'll share some theory, uh, theory of failures and stuff. Uh, but before I sort of explain what I'm going to talk about during the entire talk, I kind of want to tell you a true story. And as a crowd, I would love to remind you that uh, this is a true story. This actually happened. Uh, it is the first failure I've ever experienced using data. Uh, I must stress, it actually happened. Uh, it's also something I learned a lot from, but it is also super embarrassing because it is the story of the first A+. It's also the only A+, that I've ever gotten in college. And you have to imagine the story is kind of like this. Like some of you probably had like an educational background where you also had this first year class in statistics. And very typically, what the professors really like you to do is, you know, you have your first year of statistics, you know what a regression is, then the teacher says, go out there and find yourself a real world data set uh, and apply statistics to it. Uh, and there were some students who were doing like, I remember a friend of mine doing like research on, you know, the population size of a country and how many Olympic medals you might win, etc. But as it was, uh, while I was doing this gig, while I was doing statistics, I had a gig, like a, a job. Uh, at a bar at a local theater, uh, and the theater just celebrated its uh, 12th year anniversary. Uh, and the, the, they kind of had a problem because they were thinking about maybe expanding, but they didn't really know for sure. So you know, I asked for their data about their like growth rates and stuff, and they happily gave it to me. And then hopefully I could apply statistics. And if I could apply statistics, I would both impress my boss, who might give me a raise, and I might get an A from the professor. Um, so the chart I'm about to show you uh, was made in like 2007, so it was made with Illustrator. I had to actually manually draw every single rectangle like this, so thank you to all the matplotlib committers that we don't have to do that anymore. But the graph that you're looking at is sort of the growth rate. So like in year one, there was like a lot of growth compared to the year before. What we're doing is we're checking how many people were in a room the year before and how many people are in the room now, like in a theater room, so to say. And you know, in the beginning, you see the growth was like pretty high, and then after that, the growth is kind of low, and then you know, 12 data points. So I did what my professor asked me. I put a linear regression line through this. And it turned out to be significant, right? That's great. So even if you have 12 points of data, statistically, you can sort of point out that something might be significant. And this gave me statistical evidence to point out that the theater should not expand because clearly the growth had been stagnated. Uh, and the teacher loved it because the teacher actually said, yo, you actually went out there and you got like a, a business case. You solved it within a couple of weeks. 10 out of 10. So, you know, it's the best. The future's looking great because I'm a young kid and I can do, you know, data science. I'm going to be an enterprise person, wear a suit, make money and all that. Um, then two years, like two days later, I was at the same bar at the same theater, and you know, you know these evenings when you're behind the bar and like the house is like super packed, like everyone's sweating because it's so packed. It was one of these nights, and then the week after, I had another one of these nights where the house was like super packed and like people were sweating and stuff. So then I started thinking, you know, technically, you cannot sell more tickets if every chair in a theater is taken. So the growth might have stagnated simply because there were no more seats to sell. And if you then put a model through the thing that says, yeah, the growth has stopped, you are measuring the wrong thing, and you are sort of solving the wrong problem. And this definitely happened. My boss was super happy with the result. My statistics professor was super happy with the result. But this was one of those moments where I was so focused on the method that I completely neglected the fact that I was chasing a vanity task. And it's always at these sort of moments where you look yourself in the mirror and you say, crap, I solved the wrong problem. And it's not just me. I think a lot of people, a lot of times, they're having this problem over and over and over again. And, you know, like solving problems is hard. It, it, I'm not suggesting that solving problems is always super easy. But lately, I've noticed that exactly what happened to me when I was like in college, um, I see that happen to like a bunch of people. I've noticed that algorithms are sort of starting to distract us from what we're actually supposed to do. And like, there's a lot of hype, like Hacker News and whatnot, uh, like that the algorithm might save us, right? There's a lot of hype around deep learning and all these things. But um, in this talk, I kind of hope to convince you that it's all the stuff around the algorithm that is actually the solution. That maybe the algorithm itself is not really a special citizen or anything like that. But if we are able to convince ourselves of this, then maybe we're going to be much better at making solutions. And I'll share a few stories. Uh, one story about a recommender, one story about rephrasing and world hunger, one story about a Kaggle hack, which the funniest thing, um, and a story about a time series task. So I hope we're excited about that. Um, 
I'm assuming that at least a lot of you are Dutch, and if you're Dutch, you've probably noticed this website. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this website, basically this is the Dutch BBC. And for those of you that are not used to Dutch BBC, this is online television, it's like Netflix. Um, <laughs> and if you're not familiar to Netflix, uh, welcome to my data. But, um, so the idea is when you pause a video or when you're like at the end of a video, there's this prompt that sort of says, hey, you're watching this content, maybe you'd like to watch this other content as well. Um, and the idea here is, of course, that you know, if you see something you might like, other people might have also seen stuff that you might like, but you're not aware of it. So the organization sort of came up to us and said, hey, would you like to maybe you know, do some recommender stuff, maybe do something with algorithms? Uh, and the way it kind of worked, and I'll be paraphrasing a little bit, um, like when I joined this project, there were like two months of data, like one of our engineers started collecting data, making some stacks and stuff, and uh, it's not like they didn't have anything at the moment, like their editorial department had like a rule-based system that was actually not the worst idea, like if you watch something from a certain broadcaster, maybe recommend something that's popular from the same broadcaster, like in that sort of realm, they kind of already had something. And when we started talking to them, they were sort of thinking like, yeah, like if you could cost 25% clicks, that would be kind of a nice goal, if you get like 25% clicks extra, then your recommender is sort of doing better. And after talking with them, and they were like really, like they really understood the product in this sense, we quickly came to the conclusion that clicks is not the thing we're interested in. Like you can optimize for clicks, but what you're going to do then is like clickbaiting. Instead, what we said was we like it if people click, we like it even more if people watch the content after the click. So it's really cool if you're going to watch the next episode of the show, but if you're not going to watch it, like we, we, the click is okay, we want you to watch it afterwards. And as we were sort of discussing this, uh, there were people in my filter bubble around me um, that were suggesting, like, oh, you get to do recommender, you should totally check out this thing called deep learning. Um, and what I kind of want to mention is, like, a lot of people at this point in time say, oh, there's so many algorithms, here's a paper, here's a paper, you should totally do deep learning. And what I just want to mention that's hopefully the obvious thing, the first thing you do is not consider deep learning, the first thing you do is you draw something up like this. Because you're trying to understand the problem a bit better. So what we had was like a part where we had like the video player and that was sort of the user interface. And out of that came like, okay, this user, if we're going to check if a recommender is better, we also need to have some sort of way to do A-B testing. Like if I cannot prove that my algorithm is better than your algorithm, if there's no way to sort of put you in A and a B group. And then if I think about it, after that happens, um, probably I'm not going to be able to calculate these things on the fly because it might be a heavy calculation. So I'm probably going to be needing a database. And the database is kind of like a caching mechanism such that I can say, okay, this item maps to all of these items, and I should definitely calculate that beforehand. And if I have a database and need something of a cron job or airflow where the new data comes in, and then there's like an algorithm that I can apply that pushes stuff into this database. But even after that, thinking about the problem again, I, cannot pr I probably cannot recommend all the material all the time. So as great as Die Hard is as a movie to some people, I should never recommend that after Sesame Street. And I don't know if it's like normal for me to expect that the algorithm will always automatically pick this up. There's a lot of artificial stupidity that could happen there. So I do need some sort of checking mechanism just to be sure uh, that nothing bad will happen. And, you know, this is one of the first things you typically do. You draw a thing like this. But one thing I want to point out, the algorithm is like a small cog in this entire system. It's all the stuff around the algorithm that actually brings the solution to the table and will make everything work. This algorithm is like small beans compared to the rest of it. And I do hope it's sort of obvious that like 90% of the effort in sort of engineering and all that is not the algorithm, it's all the other stuff. So you have to imagine the deep learning people around me, they were sort of like, okay, that sort of makes sense, let's, let's build all of that first. So you have to imagine then the project went on, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but let's imagine that we built everything below the algorithm stuff here. And then the deep learning people sort of come in the office again, they say, oh, we're going to do deep learning, let me use TensorFlow. And then that would be a very good time to say no, because the, the thing you probably want to do first, because if you're going to use an A-B testing system and you want that A-B testing system to sort of be reliable for the next five years, the first thing you probably want to do is test this A-B testing system. Because it's very, it, like it happens sometimes that this A-B testing system is not purely random, that there's some sort of bias that certain people from certain areas of the Netherlands maybe are overpopulated in the A group as opposed to in the B group. And I would really, really hate it if five years from now I discover that the A-B testing system is broken. So there's nothing wrong with running an AA test. It's like one of those things where if you just do that, your solution is already a bit more reliable. So again, you have to imagine there's some deep learning people that sort of go, okay, that's also reasonable, I guess, sure. Um, but then again, there were some, some, some thoughts like, okay, once you do that, can you then do deep learning? And then again, we sort of said no, because there's some other stuff you can do that's also better for the solution. What you can also do, um, if you want to understand the system, 
how about we just have an algorithm B that's nothing more than just random stuff? So I just give you a random episode. If you do that, you know, that, that's obviously not the best algorithm. But the cool thing is, you do measure how many people will click anyway. And if I want to compare my algorithm to like, people who click anyway, that margin is something that's very interesting. Suppose that your algorithm is like 2.2% people that click and stuff, but randomness will have 2% of people click as well, then you get a pretty good proxy that you probably do not understand the problem. And measuring that, I think, is a very good thing, but it's one of those steps that people sort of forget about because they focus on the algorithm. And even after you do this, before you do deep learning, there's another thing you can sort of do, because if you think about bias and people clicking anyway, what you can also even do is like, test the order of things in here, right? So you might even say something in the order of, well, this algorithm thinks that one, uh, item one is the best item. Well, if people are going to click the first item anyway, how about we put the best item on slot number three? Maybe that way more people will click in total because you can convince more people to sort of click the better thing. And again, this is one of those moments where it's a very good thing to just test, and you can totally do this before even thinking about the algorithm because it helps you understand the problem a whole lot better. So if you imagine like, the team I was in, we were doing stuff like this. We were really, really fundamentally just trying to figure out, you know, is this sort of the problem? Are we sort of getting a system? Is this going to work? And also, while doing this, we were continuously testing the A-B splitting stuff, the database scaling, and the checking mechanism. These were all things that we were really able to test that they were working properly. So <laughs> by this time, the deep learning people were getting kind of antsy, right? So there's these, all these algorithm people who are sort of waiting all this time for us to sort of really push the big algorithm that's supposed to go out. And I had kind of had to disappoint a lot of them, because when we were sort of thinking about it, we at some point said, you know, instead of deep learning, how about we just recommend the next episode? Um, which made the deep learning advocates kind of go, oh, right. <laughs> and again, this, like, I'm definitely paraphrasing here. It's not in the case that there were like, actually deep learning people knocking the door and demanding anything like that. That's not how it happened. But I do notice a lot of the times that there are these people who sort of dream about a solution, but not about the problem. And that is a problem. Because uh, if you think about it, just to emphasize a few of these hype cycles, I don't think the real issue in 2016 was that we weren't using Apache Spark. I still do not think that the problem in 2018 was that we were not using deep learning. I also do not think that this year the problem is going to be that we're not using AutoML, uh, even though Hacker News is suggesting you should all use it. Now, I think the problem is probably more in the sense that, as a data scientist, you typically don't talk to your end users, and maybe you don't regularly drink coffee with the working people who are supposed to be using your app. Um, and I also think because we're probably trained to really, really think about a sort of quantitative way about our algorithms and about our systems, that maybe we forget about the qualitative level about our system. And the reason why I think that that is so sort of important that we don't lose eye of that is because by doing all these experiments and by sort of trying to understand the system, I was actually able to design a really, really good algorithm here. And to explain the thought there, like, imagine, if you will, that like, I have a couple of series. I have series A, I have series B, I've got series C. And let's suppose that I know that you just watched Series A. And the overlap of people that watch Series C and the people that watch Series B, that's equal. That's 50 people who watch both shows, so to say. The only real difference is that this show is more popular than that show. Well, if that's the case for this platform, I think it's a much, much better idea to recommend C. Because if you think about it, B, for example, in extreme case, could be the news. And everyone could be watching the news, right? It's something that you will watch independent of our recommendations. It makes no sense to recommend something that you're going to be watching anyway. And with this philosophy in mind, it's, it was relatively easy to just come up with some sort of formula. And the easy version is just, this is the overlap that you saw in the chart before. And this is sort of the entire circle that we had in the Venn diagram before. This is the stuff that I do like. This is the stuff that I don't like. If I just calculate this between all the series i and j, I have a pretty good score function. I'm basically, I have in my mind what I would like to see in my algorithm, and by just defining the score function like this, I also have the algorithm. Um, there's some, like, tons of benefits about this algorithm, because it's just counting, right? Uh, one of the other cool things, like sending you from i to j, is not equal to sending you from j to i. But this simple formula, like, a variant of this is still alive, I think, at that client. Um, and I've used this algorithm a bunch and a bunch of times. And it turns out it works quite well. If your interest is that you want to cause a lot of serendipity, by thinking about the problem, you realize this is a formula for serendipity. This is a way to describe that. And 
I believe the algorithm is live today. Um, when we launched it, it cost some number X percent more on the platform. Like instantly over the weekend, we just saw like a skew going up. Um, and we were also able to prove that we weren't doing clickbait. And this is, I think, the coolest chart that I've ever made in my career. I do have to explain it a little bit. But imagine, if you will, that this was the chart for, their, um, for what people click. So if this is very high, then in 2016, uh, if you click a recommendation that comes from the business rule engine, most of the stuff you will be clicking is from 2016. So what this chart is sort of saying is, if you were getting your recommendations from the business rules, odds are that the content you're watching is probably from the most recent year. But if you were watching that from like my formula with like the thing I came up with, it was actually kind of normal that people would not just click but watch content from like four years ago. So we were able to really prove that this algorithm wasn't just giving people that what they wanted to click on, but we were actively diversifying sort of all the content that they were having. And if you're like uh, a person who has lots of content, but you, this is great because this is all content you're not paying for anymore. And if you can still use, find ways to get people interested in that content, that's a win-win because it's content you don't have to pay for. And for me, at least, some of the lessons here was like, because I was able to qualitatively think about this problem, you know, if you have a good heuristic, two for loops in an if statement can totally whoop a neural network's ass. That's, that's kind of easy to do. You just have to understand the problem very well. And this mental thing of taking a step back and wondering, like, what's the actual problem, that's a very sort of nice way to get there. And I don't think there's any shame in trying to understand the problem, because if you do a lot of these A-B tests to try to understand your users, that is a very good progress towards a good solution. And blindly following a book or a blog would probably not have given me this approach. And just to mention, this, this algorithm is really sweet, because if you look at the entire system, there's all sorts of parts that we can just go ahead and replace. So if the world changes, it's fairly easy, probably in a system like this, to sort of make amends and make sure that you're able to change as the world changes. Yeah, and again, I would simply not have gotten here if I would have believed the true like, deep learning gospel or anything like that. They're just taking a step back and wondering, what am I actually doing? Next episode and the heuristic like this, it really goes a long way. And this is like one situation where I was very happy and able to sort of, you know, avoid solving the wrong problem, I think. But there's other situations as well. Um, and to sort of exemplify how you might be able to solve a problem by rephrasing it, what I will first do is give like a mathematical introduction to what I mean by that. And then I will tell you a story about how the World Food Organization, as has been told by me, was able to save a bunch of lives. Um, who here watches, like, have you heard of like 99% Invisible, the podcast? Could you raise your hand if you've seen like a couple of you? Okay, it's like an amazing podcast. And if you're interested in having like very odd math questions to solve, listen to this podcast. It goes, it's about design. And this is one episode where uh, there was a competition where if you would live on the billboard for as long as possible, you might be able to win a house. And this was like, I think in the 60s when there was a deep recession in the United States. And all these candidates who got into this competition, some of them wrote 10,000 letters to the radio station in order to you know, get into this competition. So that's a fun math problem. Because um, what you want to do is you want to maybe decide the optimal uh, number of letters to send to the contest. Um, and you'll lose if they open two of your envelopes, but you'll win if they op open only one. So you want to send as many envelopes as possible such that the odds of opening one of them is very high, but not too much such that the odds of opening two envelopes is higher. This is a fun little math problem. This is what I do when I'm on a bus. Um, and if, and you know, listen, listening to the podcast, you kind of go, all right, there's like a couple of free variables. There's like the number of contestants who will be picked in total. Uh, there's a number of letters that sort of I send in. Uh, there's a number of letters that other people send in. And sort of the math equation, like if you only pick one contestant, uh, the odds of being selected is just S over A plus S. S is the number of letters, again, that I send in. The math is not super important, but if only one person is picked, it ha you just want to send as many letters as possible. And then if two people get picked, okay, it's sort of the same thing, except you can be either the first person who gets picked, or you can be the second person who gets picked. And you have to sort of follow the math, but it kind of gets tricky here, because it's not just S on top of the equation here, but it's also an S below the equation here, so it's a bit more of a complicated formula. And if you want to do this for being picked thrice, I mean, the beginning of the math, again, is easy. Because you could say, okay, you're either the first person who gets selected, the second person who gets selected, or the third one. First, second, third. But if then if you combine that into like one formula, um, it gets kind of tricky because you want to optimize for S, and S is above the uh, division as well as below. 
So differentiating this is kind of tricky. And there's a very cool tool called SymPy. You can just throw it in there, and usually it solves everything. But even SymPy had a problem, because differentiating basically made the equation longer. And trying to solve this for zero, like it, <laughs> my computer just gave up at some point. Um, so this is actually kind of a very tricky math problem. Because you have to differentiate a free variable as both above the uh, divider as below. But, but here's the funny thing. If you just take this one small step to like, rephrase one thing, what I could do is I could say, how about I take a plus s, and that's equal to t, and I'll have that be the constant, and s still be the free variable. Then I can rephrase this equation into this one. And again, t is now a constant, and this is a polynomial that's super easy to solve. This is like not even a calculus exam. My, uh, calculus exam questions are way harder than this, typically. So then you have a closed form solution, and it's great. And the only way that you would have gotten here is you would have had the insight that your math equation needed to be rephrased. That was sort of the, the thing, the trick, that made this a lot easier than it had to be, it was the easy, as easy as it should be. And this is like a very small mental step, right? Just rephrase like one equation, and that's it. But I've noticed that in machine learning, there's a lot of opportunities where a similar thing sort of happens. Um, it's very hard to recognize, but rephrasing is actually a very awesome tool to solve a real-world problem. And again, I'm about to tell you a problem. I heard this secondhand. I was at a different conference for operations research people. So I'm, I wasn't involved in any of this research, but I think the, drive, uh, the point that I'm making will drive everything home. So I have to imagine that if you're the World Food Organization, uh, you try to, like, uh, there's a lot of villages, let's say, uh, that are in short need of food. So what you can do as a village, you can sort of say, hey, I need bread, beans, and beef. Uh, and then there are some volunteers at the World Food Organization who are into, like, logistical algorithms, like the operations research uh, group, typically. Um, and they will find a very efficient logistical scheme to make sure that this uh, town gets the bread, the beans, and the beef. And, you know, these are... Typically, quite complicated algorithms. So you have a couple of shipping ports you've got to keep in mind, and there's a couple of villages you have to keep in mind. Uh, there's like transport costs and that sort of thing. There's availability of crops and all of that stuff. Um, super interesting problem, but they are very hard. Uh, these things are like NP hard. Uh, people th thought they were so hard, they came up with two letters for it. Um, also, like these algorithms typically don't scale well at all. Uh, often you need to have like one single machine because it's not something you can distribute easily. Um, and it's not unheard of to hear stories of servers running for like days and weeks to solve a problem. And, these, and usually like the algorithms that you consider, they don't even have like a guarantee of optimality. So you have like Christophides initialization, cheapest, furthest insertion, two, three opt, annealing, greedy. So you have to imagine that there's like lots and lots of experts, like really clever people, trying to sort of apply all of these things and maybe get to the optimal solution and stuff. But the thing is, the algorithm doesn't matter because they were solving the wrong problem. Because if you hear someone say, I need bread, beans, and beef, what you should really hear is say, I need carbohydrates, fiber, and protein. I don't need beans, I need nutrients. And you know, you might have heard of the Stigler diet problem, but if you think about it, the human being needs like a couple of grams of you know, uh, calcium, a few grams of protein, calories, etc. But you can get them from many different foodstuffs, right? And certain foodstuffs are cheaper than other foodstuffs. And what's more, certain foodstuffs are just closer than others. It might be that the place that has lentils for your town is a lot closer than the place that has beans. It might be the case that if you have lentils, you only need a truck. And in the case that you have beans, you need some sort of shipyard to get the ship from a different port. Now imagine that you're sort of trying to design an algorithm here. You can write the best algorithm ever for this problem. But if you've defined the problem in the wrong way, if not done this one rephrasing trick, you're still solving the wrong problem. And the, let's, let's be honest here, this is one of those things that the algorithm will not be able to figure out on its own. You probably want to design an algorithm to take this sort of stuff into account. Because um, if the algorithm isn't aware of this search space, it won't be able to look in it. And like, the best thing in life, of course, is that you can go from something like this to something like this, right? This is what you're trying to do. You're not trying to write a paper about the coolest algorithm or anything like this, but in this situation, you might be saving lives. And that's sort of, I think, a cooler thing than optimizing for an ROC curve. And, and I do think there's like this risk that if you're in a team where only algorithm people reside, um, it might be very hard to test the algorithm in the real world, because if you really want to look at the problem from multiple angles, your team probably needs to be a bit more inter like interdisciplinary. Um, in this particular example, and again, I heard about it th for third hand, so I'll just assume it's mostly true. Um, but it wasn't the algorithm that saved the world, ra rather the understanding of it. Uh, a better algorithm, in this case, definitely would have had a worse outcome if it was used on the wrong problem. And again, like taking a step back and rethinking turns out to be a pretty good trick. 
Turns out, though, that this is one of those real-world examples. But the whole taking a step back thing, you can also use that to win in very mechanical, very algorithmic challenges as well. So now I would like to talk about a Kaggle problem. Um, who here does Kaggle once in a while? Not a whole lot of people. Uh, I don't either, but there's this one challenge every year where they have, well, they have something with Santa, and those are sort of more the operations research problems, um, like the, the purely mathematical optimized system type problems, which is kind of my background. So those are the problems I really, really like. And the problem that Kaggle sort of came up with is basically they said, you know, we, Santa forgot how much the gifts weigh. So I might be able to put a book in the bag, I might be able to put a ball in the bag, and then I have one bag of gifts. Uh, I might be able to put another book and another two balls in a different bag. But if I put too much gifts in a bag, there's a probability that the bag might rip. And the thing I've got to optimize is, I want to have as many bags as possible with, with as much weight as possible, but I never want a bag to rip, and I don't know exactly how much these things weigh. The only thing I know is that these things come from a distribution that Kaggle was nice enough to supply in this NumPy code. So uh, horses weighed a certain amount of stuff, books weighed a certain amount of stuff, blocks and trains and whatnot. Um, and sort of what you kind of get then is this awkward moment where you sort of have to consider, am I going to do like lots of light bags and then none of the bags will rip, right? That's a tactic. Then I'm at least very sure that what I send to Kaggle is actually in the score. Uh, what you can also do is go for the other route. You can kind of say, no, screw it. I'll just, some of the bags might be ripped, but I'm compensating because all the other bags will have lots of stuff in it. Or you can kind of make a mix of these two things, right? But this is basically the problem. Uh, when I send one allocation of all these bags to Kaggle, I get one score back, and that's the total sum of all the non-ripped bags. So I don't get a whole lot of information back. And you know, if you're an operations research person, the first thing you do is you write stuff like this down. So what are you optimizing, and what is sort of the constraint? So the way that I was sort of thinking about the problem was um, you just have to sort of assign an item to a bag, and then you can sort of take the expected value of that item as sort of the thing you gain. But you have to do this with a constraint, because you do want to minimize the risk that you're going to get near the max weight. And I thought I had a pretty cool algorithm. There's a colleague of mine, Yelta, I was doing this with. We had a really great time. It was a fun puzzle. So I used OR tools with some simulated weights, and I generated lots of solutions, and I sort of had the tactic of, uh, of like upload often and pray. Not the best tactic, <laughs> I can say. But we had a lot of fun, so well, it was fun. Um, and other people, they also did sort of the, uh, the guessing game, so they would like upload three times a day, really try to sort of learn the weight of this one little gift. And then sort of the game became that a lot of people were sort of calculating how many uploads they needed in order to perfectly solve the problem, so to say. And, and like, the forum was great. You could, you could just read whatever people were doing. There were lots of hackings and stuff. But a lot of the problems were sort of around this solution as well. So I was content. And then after a few weeks, uh, someone on the forum demonstrated that everyone was solving the wrong problem. And let's focus on an epic hint that Kaggle gave us. This is how everything was generated, right? So presumably, one part of the code that they did not show was this. <laughs> right? So I'm about to read a part of the Kaggle forum for you. And this was actually on the Kaggle forum. So this was someone, uh, the, guy named, uh, the guy's name was uh, Toby Cheese. And if you're out there on YouTube, again, I, this was one of the things that you know, made my day. Uh, so what he, re what he said was, uh, there was one thing left in this competition that I wanted to do ever since uh, a discussion started. Um, and that thing was to see if maybe it's possible to brute force the seed values used to generate the toy weights. Imagine my disappointment when I actually succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then there's some extra information. Apparently, the, um, the number of possible seeds is only like somewhere in the like, 4 billion area instead of like t multiples of 10 higher than that um, because of some weird NumPy internals. Rolf, I need to maybe talk to you about that. I'm interested to know hear your story. Uh, and also, there's a seeding, so like, you can parallelize this on many different computers, which is what the guy did. Uh, essentially, he had like, this giant for loop and totally parallelized that and all sorts of cores. And the thing was, he submitted one score and if any one of his uh, sort of random seeds sort of met that one allocation perfectly, bang, you've got your hit and all your risk is gone. Here's the official statement from Kaggle. <laughs> so the Kaggle team said, yes, I'm embarrassed to admit that in my pre-holiday scramble to put this together, I thought about uh, extra seeds to vary it, but I didn't do it well enough. Uh, so we had like two random seed points. Uh, there wasn't enough. Uh, so there was still enough information that uh, Toby was able to learn. Um, and this, is, I, I, this was like one of those marvelous moments where you just think, like, I get that it's like really hard to think outside of the box when you're in it, 
And that's also sort of why this like, hilarious, awesome, optimal solution on Kaggle was almost an afterthought. Um, but this will happen in real life for us as well. It's not just the real world problem, it's, it's probably going to be the algorithmic problems as well. And I, I kind of have a, like, this is a personal theory that I got from John Cleese, but like, I do think maybe a way to deal with this is like, uh, it does show that good ideas pop around when you're not in like, work work mode. Uh, it's a lot better to sort of try to get these ideas when you're sort of more in a work play mode. Uh, five minutes, gotcha. Um, so I think encouraging this work play mode thing is kind of like a no-brainer. If you're an organization, you've got a bunch of smart, creative people, just give them some play time once in a while, because I think that's the only way that you're able to get sort of hacks like this in your team. And it might just be super beneficial to your business. Um, and the next story will demonstrate this point even more. And I will say with this story, it is, I think, hilarious, but it's very hard to verify if it's true. I read in the book it's true, but the book's from the 80s. But as a story goes, right, it's about a time series problem, but as a story goes, there is a condom factory. And, and they kind of have this problem. Because um, the thing is, when you make your product, um, either the factory has to be on, and you, you make lots of the thing, and then you have to move it to the warehouse. But both the factory and the warehouse are like super expensive, and they're really hard to turn on and off. Because you hire the factory in a lot of cases, so then what you've got to do is you've got to sort of plan when the factory can be on or off, because a competitor might be using the factory at the same time. So you kind of have to be able to plan this around, if you will. So then a clever guy, uh, supposedly, uh, came up with a business case. And the idea was as follows. I mean, it, was, it was like the 90s, 80s, I suppose, right? So you had this like, small army of consultants in suits. Let's call them the econometric army. And the business case they sort of got was they basically said, look, if you can predict the demand for this product, then we are much able to plan the factory, and then also we're much, be able, uh, much better to plan like, the warehouse, and it's like, going to be a huge, huge cost saver. Like, this, this will be great. So the econometric army, supposedly, in the story, they, they went in, they fiddled around, and after two months, but they came back and said, yep, it's really hard to predict, no dice. So management was like super disappointed, and then, you know, as the story would go, like, one of the managers was having a walk in the park, and it, it sort of occurred to the, to the manager person. Because if you think about it, the, the problem sort of is that we want to predict this time series P1. But it turns out that P1 is impossible to predict. And apparently, because it's hard to predict, that's the thing that makes planning the, uh, the factory kind of hard. So how about we ignore the time series, but we do something that makes the planning of the factory super easy? Because what you could also do then is you can sort of say, you know what, how about I just find a different product made from the same material that correlates negatively? If there is such a product where if, you know, product one is super high, product two is super low, and vice versa, then there's no need to predict the market because you're always able to produce something. Supposedly, this is how latex pacifiers got invented. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but I do like the story. Um, and, and, I, and I like the story so much because uh, when I read the story for the first time, it really took me by surprise. Like, I'm an algorithmic person. I'm trained with the idea that my algorithm thing is the thing that solves the other thing. Uh, but this is one of those examples where it's sort of obvious that the only way you're going to get the solution is if you allow yourself a bit more creativity, if you allow yourself to sort of think out the box. And maybe as a, you know, if, if we want the AR winner to sort of never happen, if you want to sort of convince people in suits that machine learning is great, Maybe we also need to get better at understanding the theater and like, recommending the next episode and considering lentils over beans and pivoting the pacifiers and that sort of thing. Because the more and more I started thinking about it and some of the crazy stuff that I hear from like, uh, my peers, like, I really fundamentally think that understanding the problem is much more important than understanding the solution. And just in general, I think we should maybe take a step back and think more about the system around the algorithm. Uh, and when you're designing a system, it's probably a much better idea than not focus on a single part, but rather maybe the communication between two parts. Like having a bit more of a holistic view there might be like a really good thing. And especially in this case, like it's kind of zen, but rephrasing might be your best friend. Just like take lots of moments with your team, reflect on what you're doing. Maybe you've rephrased the problem in the wrong way. And when you're doing that, you're probably going to realize that maybe you need to stop being just a data team, and maybe you just need to be more of an interdisciplinary team that owns a part of the, like the product or just the product team or something like that. Don't live in a rabbit hole. 
You should really try to prevent this intellectual laziness. It's really okay to have to admit that you might not really fully understand the problem, and it's definitely okay, also for burnout reasons, to take a break once in a while. And a lot of these problems, I really think they solve themselves if you go running, or you just have like one of your banter moments, uh, like only Dutch people will get that reference, but <laughs> if you just have one of those banter moments with your friends in the bar, um, and I guess the only thing I have to say after this is like, go to your local theater, because there's amazing stuff to see on stage. <laughs> Thanks.